A very hearty good morning to everyone present here. On behalf of the Economics Association of Sri Venkateshwar College, I, Navya Jindal, President of the Association, would like to extend a warm welcome to our guests, professors, and students, and thank them for joining us this morning. All of us feel euphoric and thrill beyond words to commence the second day of Bliss Point 2022 the annual economics festival of Sri Venkateshwar College, which is certainly going to be another wholesome day of gaining knowledge and exposure and having fun while learning and acquiring a plethora of skills. The flagship event of the economics department, Bliss Point, was organized for the first time 30 years back from today. Each year since then, the festival has been conducted with great pomp and show. With everything from the themes to the decorations and the events, the amount of participation is becoming bigger and better with each successive year. This point unequivocally stands out to be the pride of the economics department of Sri Venkateshwar College and over the years has evolved into one of the most reputed and expansive economics festival in the whole of Delhi University. We feel extremely proud and privileged of the fact that even a deadly pandemic which forced the world to shut down and shook everything around us couldn't stop us from carrying our legacy and our pride forward and coming up with the 30th volume of our, of our annual festival, Bliss Point 22. I would now like to invite Naman Kapoor, Vice President of the Association, to talk about our theme for this year. Thank you, Navya. As so many things have changed around the world because of COVID-19 pandemic, many new ways of working and living emerged. With shops closed and the world shut down, we have all moved online. From ordering groceries on Instamart to taking college lectures on Zoom, Google Meet, Classroom, etc. And doctors having taken to teleconsulting, our lives have changed dramatically. The new emerging economy is digitized, connected, and personalized. However, key decisions in terms of taxation, pricing, and the disruption of industries due to automation are yet to be taken. We also need to prepare uh, for blockchain technology and AI, but it is clearer by the day that a digital economy can facilitate broad-based growth and increase productivity for all businesses. Hence, the theme for this year is Digital economics, a new era. Now, I would like to invite my co vice president, Ridham Aluwalia, to take it from here. Uh, I think Ridhima is facing some connection issues, so I'll just take over. Um, we consider ourselves extremely lucky as we conduct the speaker session with subject experts to gain deeper insights of the changing human world and emerging aspects in the field of economics. Our speakers have proved themselves at every stage by being the co consummate professionals and masters of their own field and the epitome of true inspiration that they are for all of us. So for today, we have amongst us, uh, we have amongst us our distinguished keynote speaker who has taken out time from the uh, busy professional life to share their valuable experience and knowledge with everyone present here. Truly, there is no better way to kickstart the second day of Bliss Point 22 than having a discussion with Domain Master on the topic of cryptocurrency and metaverse and get, getting to learn from those who started as learners and now have come a long way ahead in their lives. I would now like to invite Araba to introduce our speaker. Uh, thank you so much, Ridhima. I'm pleased to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Karthik uh, Higataketi, to this event. Dr. Karthik is currently serving as the Deputy Secretary, Department of Personnel and Training, Government of India. His experience spans over nine years. 
He has an experience of four years with the Ministry of Railways by working as an assistant commercial manager, assistant operations manager, and division commercial manager. He has over three years of experience with the, with the Department of Personnel and Training, Government of India, as Under Secretary prior to being Deputy Secretary. He is the author of 11 books and 45 plus research papers on versatile topics. He talks about various topics such as energy, future, blockchain, cryptocurrency, as well as infrastructure. Dr. Karthik also holds a degree in Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery from the Karnataka Institute of Medical Sciences. Thank you for joining us today, sir. With a highly successful professional career to your name, we are sure that the students present today have a lot to learn from you. I would now like you to take over and uh, express your keynote address. Yeah. I hope I am uh, audible. Uh, yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah. I'll be sharing the presentation of today's topic. Sure, sir, definitely. I hope the presentation is visible. Uh, yes, sir, it is visible. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, uh, on the outset, I would like to thank uh, <clears throat> Sri Venkateshwara College, which is a very prestigious college, a part of the DU, uh, for giving me an opportunity to discuss this a uh, very new and interesting topic of digital economics, a new era, <clears throat> cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. Now, when we talk of the metaverse, in the same breath, we talk of Web 3.0, we talk of uh, cryptocurrencies, we talk of blockchain technology, and all of these are clubbed together uh, in what we call as digital economics. Economics traditionally, but in a digital sense. Let us have a look. Let us explore this world of digital uh, The organizers, I would request if there is any disturbance uh, in my uh, uh, connection or uh, in the video feed, please let me know. Sure, I sir, hope sure. I'm audible and uh, the presentation is visible. Yes, sir. Both are you're, you're audible and the presentation is visible. Yeah, this is the next slide. I hope the next slide is also visible. I'm yes, just sir, confirming. Yes. Yeah, so that uh, we get a good flow uh, while discussing. <clears throat> Right. Now, coming back to the topic. In October of 2019, Google achieved what was called as quantum supremacy. Now, if you see the image uh, on your screen, you see so you see a kind of a machine <clears throat> with the gold colored wires and all that stuff. Uh, and at the center of it, you see a red uh, or a purplish red color square. Now, that is what is the heart of a quantum computer. Right. And this image is uh, kind of a zoomed uh, zoomed in image, but if you see, it's the size of uh, uh, a half half the size of a human body, right? It appears uh, quite big, but it's small to scale. But behind it, there is a lot of machinery. Almost uh, infrastructure, the size of an entire building, is behind this small uh, machine. And uh, this is a quantum computer. Now, what's a quantum computer? You may ask. See, the computer on the computer that we are working with right now, on which this presentation is happening, these are pretty fast computers. And these computers, when they are scaled up, they become what we call as supercomputers. All of us might have heard of supercomputers. Quantum computers are a different class of computers altogether. They are not your supercomputers in the normal sense of the term. <clears throat> now, this particular quantum computer did something amazing. It solved a problem which would take the world's fastest supercomputer at present, 10,000 years to solve. This quantum computer solved it in 200 seconds flat. 200 seconds. A normal supercomputer would have taken 10,000 years, but this solved the problem in just 200 seconds. That's the power of this <clears throat> quantum computer. If such is the strength of the quantum computer, it can break any code, it can break any kind of encryption, right? But why am I discussing this in a lecture on blockchain technology? Friends, that is because blockchain provides one of the few ways of quantum resistant cryptography. It means that blockchain technology is one of the potentially few systems of information transfer that cannot be hacked by quantum computers. So far, I'm telling as of now, maybe in future it might be broken, but as of now, it has been found that 
quantum computers uh, are not able to break the encryption of blockchain technology. So now what is this blockchain? Everyone is talking about blockchain and it is personified by Bitcoin. Hence, blockchain is a decentralized and distributed digital ledger used to record transactions across many computers so that the record cannot be altered retroactively without the alteration of all subsequent blocks and the collision of the network. <clears throat> this is kind of an official definition of blockchain. However, the International Standards Organization of which I am a voting member has not yet come out with a formal glossary of, ter formal gl uh, glossary of terms but this is more or less the consensus definition that most of the experts agree upon. So, uh, put simply, let me give you a very simple example. Instead of keeping all your data in one place, you are distributing that data in encrypted form across thousands of machines. And if you want any data, you will get it from those machines. And if you're updating any data, the uh, data will get updated in all those machines simultaneously. Okay, now this is a very revolutionary uh, method of working where if a hacker wants to hack into the network, he has to hack into all those machines at the same time because all these machines are talking to each other. They are updating each other in real time. And it becomes very difficult for a hacker or, a, uh, or an invasive uh, virus to totally wipe out any data or hack into the system. Now, blockchain is based on something called as a distributed ledger. As I said, you are dividing that data into small parts and, and uh, you are keeping it in different, different machines. A copy of that data, you are replicating it in thousands of machines. If you have one GB of data on your computer, you are replicating it 10,000 times and keeping it in 10,000 different machines, the same data. But the difference is that it is getting updated in real time. Now for this, a communication network is very important. A peer-to-peer -peer network is required as well as consensus algorithms to ensure replication across the nodes is undertaken. Now, blockchain is one category of distributed ledger technology. There are different kinds of distributed ledger technologies. <clears throat> so not all distributed ledgers necessarily employ a chain of blocks. So now what happens is, this data which is getting updated in real time, it is divided into blocks and these blocks are updated across these machines. If there is any change in this uh, data, the blocks will start to become unstable and that's how the network comes to know that someone is tampering with these blocks, right? <clears throat> now this is a very simple explanation of uh, the blockchain technology. There is a sender, then they use something called as a private key and then there's a digital signature then it is broadcast to the network and there is a node in every network and all of that uh, is propagated and finally the transactions are verified by the node and once recorded it is placed as part of that block now if anyone tampers with that block there will be instability <clears throat> okay now cutting things short Let's come to the gist of it. You are all economy students or most of you, I believe are economy students or in some manner uh, you are learning or you are having some connection with the field of economics. Presently, how do banks uh, settle their transactions, conventional tra transaction clearance? So there is a party and then there's a clearing house and then there's a centralized ledger, right? But in a blockchain, what happens is every party is having a ledger with itself. And the moment a settlement takes place, every party updates its ledger, even though it is not party to the transaction. Imagine party A and party D, right, are transacting with each other. But the ledger in with the party B also gets updated. Similarly, if party C and party B are transacting with each other, the ledger with party A and party D also gets updated. So all the ledgers with all the players keep getting updated. So this clearing house is totally eliminated here, right? Now, if you see purely from a <clears throat> mathematical perspective, now uh, the first the first image from your left, okay? Uh, you are seeing a single uh, point of, you are seeing a single point 
from which other uh, rays are emanating okay so this is a centralized uh, node nodal system okay now this is a partially decentralized nodal system and this is a fully decentralized nodal system now what happens in a decentralized nodal system is that the points of failure uh, are very low okay if any point fails the other points will take over so this basically describes that particular process now coming to distributed ledger taxonomy uh, you, could, you can have various kinds of uh, pardon so in the last uh, slide can you explain what do you mean by point of failure there yeah see now uh, in a point of failure what happens is if a single point of uh, i hope you are able to see this uh, mouse pointer i am pointing a mouse um, a mouse pointer towards the screen uh, is it visible yes yes sir yeah see uh, if you see the mouse pointer it's pointing at the center of this particular uh, diagram okay if this particular point fails the network fails correct now if in the second come to the second diagram if this particular point fails the network doesn't fail completely a large part of the network fails but still some parts are able to connect with each other now in the third diagram you uh, if this particular point fails nothing happens to the network because uh, the information transfer is routed through different different channels now if now you have to take a large number of nodes away from the network in case of the net for the network to fail now this last diagram is the, the actual description of a purely distributed ledger right this is a perfect distributed ledger where you have to take off more than 50% of the network for the network to fail so if there are 10000 points in the network 10000 machines in the network okay the hacker has to attack a, so uh, such a large number of points such a large number of machines that it becomes very difficult for him to marshal the resources to conduct that attack that's why blockchain that's why distributed ledger in the form of blockchain provides a very big hurdle uh, to the hackers to completely hack into the network and destroy the network the moment the hacker goes away from these points these points again update back whatever was there in the original network so that's why this is a very stable uh, kind of configuration and you can scale it to the maximum population possible there are 7 billion humans on earth there it's possible for uh, it's possible to have more than 7 billion machines so you can the, the scalability is infinite and ease of development there is an upfront cost for the machine but after that the network maintains itself and evolution or diversity is tremendous if there is any update in any network and if the rest of the network agrees to it so then the network can uh, update itself so it's a purely democratic form of uh, networking so this is what i meant to say that points of failure are very difficult uh, to find in a distributed ledger but it's very easy to find in a cent- Centralized ledger. You attack the head, and the whole body is gone, right? But this distributed ledger is like an amoeba. You don't know where the head is. Now coming okay. to distributed, okay. yeah, yeah. Now coming to the distributed ledger taxonomy. How many copies of the ledger are there? Now there are different kinds of distributed ledgers. You can have a trusted ledger. You can have a permissioned ledger. You can have a blockchain uh, uh, based uh, distributed ledger. So there are different kinds of ledgers now this is the distributed ledger taxonomy a traditional ledger has a centralized uh, ledger like a bank or an accountant okay then uh, you can have a group uh, a, a permissioned ledger a private shared ledger uh, uh, nowadays banks are having this what we call as bank chain your core banking system uh, when when indian banks first came up with this core banking system it was basically a private shared ledger between these banks okay they may be government banks but for all practical purposes it was between those banks only uh, private and public uh, it's not like private and uh, government it's the difference is private and public so this was not public core banking system settlement used to happen over a bank chain but it was over a centralized network then there is a trusted ledger owner or actors by validation that is permissioned public shared ledger 
you have different kinds of ledger for example ripple there is a there is a coin also called xrp it is basically a trusted ledger and unpermissioned ledger like bitcoin or ethereum now certain uh, side chains in ethereum are shared uh, we will come to that later but uh, for all practical purposes bitcoin uh, which is a personification of cryptocurrency it's a unpermissioned ledger so anyone can see all the transactions that are happening on bitcoin but the only difference is that you don't know the identity of the person conducting the transaction that's where the identity is preserved <coughs> now if you go to the actual blockchain uh, and and start to look at the blockchain this is how it appears there are no accounts in blockchain there is something called as a wallet okay wallets are digital accounts to hold bitcoin just like a bank account but the name is wallet now there is a wallet address it is like the lock it's like the lock of your house everyone can see the lock of your house but only you can enter your house because you have a key now the lock is called as the public key and your key that is the key with which you open your house is known as the private key that's the password for example your email id okay your email id is a public address whereas your password is the private private key there is no way to freeze this in 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 blockchain there is no way to freeze this one can open it by using private key only and there is no other way even the most powerful computers cannot decrypt the wallet till date till date but let let me uh, let me clarify this thing many of you might be having doubts that uh, okay we heard there are a lot of hacking going on in in blockchain and cryptocurrencies let me tell you uh, let me put things in perspective the blockchain public private key system cannot be hacked so far because it needs humongous amount humongous computing power okay and it's not just blockchain is not just your encryption it's a process uh, so it is more than mathematics it is it, it it is the physics of doing things so it becomes difficult to break a blockchain encryption but the hacking you know where it comes let me give you a real world example imagine you are having a Uh, a treasury box okay you are having a locker which is unbreakable nothing in the world can break it even if you drop a nuclear bomb on it it will won't open except with the key okay with your with your key now uh, where will you keep the key abhi chavi ko to kahi pe to rakhna padega you cannot keep a key in that locker because you are, you have to open that locker okay the world's safest locker you have the key to that lock but where do you keep the key you keep it in some other locker which is not the perfect locker okay now most of this bit a uh, cryptocurrency hacking uh, 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 issues that had happened hacking incidents it was the stealing of this private key from an unsafe locker and then being used upon that perfect locker to get access to the funds you are understanding so here the blockchain is that perfect locker your private key is that key now you are storing it somewhere you are storing it in the form of some uh, uh, some file some json uh, uh, file data file or some mnemonic uh, as as a seed or as a password or as some some letter key or you are writing it down somewhere now that gets stolen that gets hacked and they use it on the blockchain uh, and they can access the funds so this is how the hacking has been going on because if blockchain was supposed to be hackable okay if bitcoin was supposed to be hackable satoshi nakamoto the founder of bitcoin his wallet contains almost 900000 bitcoins no one has been able to access that particular wallet till date if it was hackable someone would have broken into and would have accessed those bitcoins now when we talk of cryptocurrency when we talk of blockchain see let me uh, tell you blockchain can function without a cryptocurrency cryptocurrency is the value proposition of a blockchain okay now if you go back to this network okay party a party b party c party d all of these are having their own individual ledgers now if these ledgers are maintained by these parties what is the incentive for the party to maintain the ledger tomorrow party b may talk to party a and do some uh, hanky panky in the ledger and the result may be that party c and party d might have to lose some money correct 
so how they can trust them cryptocurrencies are generated to incentivize the holding of these ledgers that's why cryptocurrencies are generated so when this network uh, this when, when you are holding those ledgers with you there is a process called mining now since this this uh, discussion right now that we are having is about metaverse and blockchain i will not go into the technical nitty gritties of how a blockchain cryptocurrency functions uh, i am just giving you the bare minimum details so that uh, we can go on to the uh, uh, metaverse and the future digital economics so uh, rest assured that mining through mining the ledgers get the cryptocurrencies okay and that incentivizes the holding of ledgers aap batao aap apne mobile mein ek ledger kyun rakhoge why will you keep a ledger in your mobile phone unless you have some benefit out of it to keep a ledger on your mobile phone you are being paid in bitcoins that's why a cryptocurrency comes into existence now bitcoin is a personification of cryptocurrency there are almost uh, 8000 8 8 9000 cryptocurrencies still date uh, the number is much higher but the listed cryptocurrencies are around 8 to 9000 which have some value to this each cryptocurrency is different in its own right there is some difference some of them are uh, a copy of the major, uh, others but there will be some value added to make them unique okay some process might be different instead of uh, the verification being done through the ledger it is done through another private group okay so there is various kinds of different variations in that but bitcoin is the most famous example and bitcoin is more understandable to people all right so that's why we discuss bitcoin as a personification of cryptocurrencies Crypt- blockchain has come into public view because of bitcoin and because of bitcoin the whole world of cryptocurrency is gaining attention so bitcoin is a worldwide cryptocurrency and digital payment system you can call it it's called it's the first decentralized digital currency since it works without a central repository it was invented by a known programmer called satoshi nakamoto so the unit of a bitcoin is called uh, the unit of account of the uh, bitcoin system is a bitcoin and there are sub units in bitcoin the smallest unit is called a satoshi that is 100 millionth of a bitcoin now today's value of bitcoin is around 40000 us dollars it had reached the peak of 60000 that's rupees 60 uh, around 30 lakhs now uh, 40000 dollars compare it with gold gold is around 53000 per 10 grams that means around 53 lakhs for a kilogram and uh, when it was 60000 dollars uh, more or less 1 kg of gold was equal to 1 1 bit 1 bitcoin so it keeps fluctuating on and off now some quick bits the market cap of bitcoin is around 745 billion dollars as as early as yesterday evening see now there is bitcoin then there are other cryptocurrencies like ethereum binance ripple then there is litecoin then there is dash then there is monero then there is uh, matic uh, matic tokens then you have polka dots and then you have shiba you know so many currencies bitcoin is a, a one of the cryptocurrencies the whole cryptocurrency market is around 1.75 trillion us dollars and the volume traded is around 108 billion us dollars bitcoin is bigger than companies like berkshire hathaway facebook that is meta nvidia visa if you see this list gold is at the top in market cap bitcoin is at number 9 cryptocurrencies as we have seen is 1.75 trillion us dollars that comes to around uh, the whole cryptocurrency market is almost equivalent to that of a little bit more than google and just below saudi aramco now we need to understand bitcoin because see at the end of the day uh, the ultimate currency is the sovereign the, the right the right of issuing currency is with the governments we'll come to that later uh, i expect many questions from all of you uh, regarding this uh, uh, the sovereign right of currency and this cryptocurrency debate but all said and done we need to understand this upcoming market for india to become a 5 trillion dollar economy we need to uh, understand this cryptocurrency market and the bigger blockchain market okay so cryptocurrency is 1.75 trillion but blockchain is much bigger than that and to become 
to completely become masters of the digital economy in some way india has to take the lead in this one if you see the application of blockchain from maximum to minimum application uh, i have made a graph okay and this has been discussed in some of my papers also where there is maximum disruption caused by blockchain and where there is minimum disruption fintech maximum disruption is caused uh, then there is something called as certification you can have certificates on the blockchain you can do voting on the blockchain uh, military and intelligence networking can be done on the blockchain then the, there are certain areas where moderate applications are there like judiciary it's possible for you to now put the proof on a blockchain and give something called as proof of existence this studies are ongoing right now then in supply chain management also blockchain has been able to be a moderate disruptor not a major one and right now in core sectors like primary sectors like agriculture and some small enterprises blockchain has been uh, not been able to make uh, so much of a disruption let me clarify one thing blockchain is not a miracle cure to anything okay blockchain can solve certain issues blockchain cannot solve certain issues okay now uh, th there is there are a group of uh, people who think that blockchain is a solution to everything we we will apply blockchain to everything it can cure cancer no blockchain cannot cure cancer but blockchain can help you manage data which can in turn facilitate your research uh, into cancer and drugs and vaccines data management blockchain is basically about data management and trust and wherever these are involved blockchain comes into picture now why why has blockchain been a major disruptor uh, i i ask many people that uh, keep the cryptocurrencies aside even without cryptocurrencies blockchain is a major disruptor why think about it today you are transferring money through neft imps rtgs what happens there is a settlement there is some person there is some babu sitting on some computer somewhere who clicks on this mouse yes isko settle kiya jaye should the transaction be settled the computer asks him. he clicks on yes there might be millions of transactions of trillions of millions of dollars uh, trillions of us dollars but someone some human being sitting somewhere is clearing those transactions but in blockchain there is no human intervention you have given the fine power of financial settlement totally to machines and this is where the first discretion uh, machines have started to get it is like saying that when we were young uh, some of you might have had pocket money uh, you i mean your parents would have given you some uh, uh, money for uh, spending maybe when you are in third standard fourth standard fifth standard but before that uh, they did not used to give you any money correct now machines have come to that phase where we have slowly started to trust them and say that okay machines will uh, do all our transactions we don't want to uh, break our heads over thousands and millions of transactions that anyway uh, have been verified so now machines have started to slowly get the power of discretion in their hands now where will this go uh imagine a scenario in the future imagine a scenario where um you have a fridge uh, all of you have fridge in your homes you open the fridge you take out a carton of milk okay and then you go to your office or your college in your case now what the fridge does the fridge is a smart fridge okay it identifies that okay uh, the milk is getting over so it sends uh it sends an uh, information to the supermarket okay think of the future maybe 2030 or 2035 the supermarket automatically orders uh, orders a milk carton i mean it uh, ready is a milk carton and through a driverless vehicle it comes to your home okay and your house robot will come out it will take the delivery of that and place it in the fridge so the next time you open the fridge you don't even think about it you just snatch a milk carton drink it throw away the milk carton okay and all the time the milk carton will be there now the question arises who paid for the milk who paid for the milk can, can any any of you here guess uh, hazard a guess 
who paid for the milk any one of you can take a guess digital payment by digital robot only by robot only wow very good guess okay uh, let me see if there are any more answers Oh, we could give the supermarket a monthly budget. Okay, a subscription model. Okay, that what we do right now. Okay, agree. Again, some more answers. Let me see, because I found. It was uh, directly I, debited I from the account, maybe. So I would like to okay, uh, right. We have two very good attempts. Uh, one of our friends here said. that the robot will pay uh, another said that uh, it was the subscription model let me tell you friends the fridge paid itself paid for the milk itself how the fridge was mining cryptocurrencies okay all the time that it was sitting there and pooling your milk it was also mining cryptocurrencies it was also mining some bitcoins and over the course of so many days what bitcoin it had uh, gained it had invested it into the cryptocurrency market or in the stock market okay it had run various algorithms okay increased its profit earned a profit for you the master okay and then paid off your bills all your bills your electricity bills your milk carton bill or whatever bill was possible with that money by your fridge itself so this is the phase of future to come this welcome to the metaverse this is a concept called smart mining this has been dealt with extensively in my work also in my research paper and also by many independent researchers across the world imagine it's the year 2030 just as i described we have uh, uh, our uh, the person if the persona of uh, uh, of our person here uh, leela is going out to the supermarket to buy groceries unlike during her mother's time Lila is not doing it out of compulsion. Lila is doing it because she wants to go out for a stroll. Her groceries were already bought yesterday, but still she is going to the supermarket. Her refrigerator, in collaboration with the kitchen shelf and the smart Tupperware, ordered and stocked up on the grocery items. Payment was done by the smart appliances online. It was all paid for by the crypto coins mined by the smart kitchen, smart fridge, and the smart Tupperware. The delivery was done by a driverless vehicle last night. when the uh, lila was sleeping and the robot verified the items and stacked them in their nominated places now lila has a kid called avni she is taking avni to the supermarket the supermarket is now a place where the local community meets once a week to spend quality time no one is going to the supermarket to buy things paper currency has now been greatly replaced it is only in very remote unconnected areas that some people still use paper currency Lila remembers her mother struggling with the many bags of groceries she used to shop for every fortnight. Now she is watching Avni play with her friends while she sips a glass of complimentary cool drinks with her neighbors at the supermarket. This is the future of the meta. Basically, it's the beginning of the metaverse. AI will probably be born on the blockchain. Why? Because we provided discretions discretion in the hands of machines. now when you provide discretion in the hands of the machines the machine will think ki what should i do how should i increase the profit of my master so it will by itself invest in stock market as per an algorithm okay or it will invest in the crypto market it will invest in a regulated crypto market to say and then earn some uh, money for the master cryptocurrency has the potential to bypass swift now coming to this regulation part why are most governments uh, apprehensive of uh, rightly so i believe rightly so uh, uh, most governments they should be uh, apprehensive of this cryptocurrencies uh, let me tell you cryptocurrencies do not need any centralized uh, clearance network uh, centralized uh, network clear clearance uh, entity okay that's why what happens is many a times it can bypass the normal route now once that happens all kinds of elements might get into it criminal elements illegal elements unregulated elements this might lead to lot of speculation and 
uh, a lot of people who are not financially literate might end up losing money. Uh, when people ask me, see, there are two camps in the entire blockchain world. One that wants regulation and the other that does not want regulation. I belong to the camp that says that it needs to be regulated. See, because if uh, for evil to flourish, the good people have to keep quiet. Right? There's a saying. Now, if a government, which is a representative of the people, which has the people's good in mind, if it is not intervening, then obviously the criminal elements will take over. Just like the atom bomb, the nuclear bomb, a nuclear bomb has so much of power, but if it is not regulated, it becomes a bomb. But if it is regulated, it becomes a nuclear reactor, which can give you electricity. Because it's a disruptive force. Similarly, cryptocurrency is a disruptive force. Now, by law, by international consensus, and it has been from a very long time, it has been agreed upon. There is no, uh, there is no debate on this topic that the power of issuing currency belongs to the sovereign authority. That's the government. Now, when you say cryptocurrency, you should not be mentioning currency. You should actually be saying crypto assets. Okay, but it has come into the parlance that it is cryptocurrency. It has come into the parlance that it is some kind of currency, but it is not a currency. It's a kind of an asset. Okay, currency is one which is issued by a government, which is issued by a sovereign entity. All right. So now a sovereign entity needs to regulate it in order to protect people from a lot of speculation that's happening. See, today uh, Bitcoin is 40,000 US dollars. I think three days back it was some 30,000 US dollars. And uh, uh, a few months back it was 60,000 US dollars. Imagine you have 1,000 rupees in your pocket, 2,000 rupees in your pocket. Okay. Tomorrow, if I say that the value of the note in your pocket is not 2,000 rupees, but 500 rupees, how will you feel? Right? You will feel betrayed. So this, uh, this has been ongoing in the crypto market. It's not stable. It is quite unstable. And to protect the people, uh, governments have come out with a lot of regulations and it's an ongoing and evolving space. Now the possibilities of blockchain technology are immense. It can be used in emerging technologies. It can be used as as NFTs, that's non-fungible tokens. It can be used in the metaverse, Web 3.0, new space age, renewable energy, so on and so forth. Now let us see one by one shortly how uh, they can be used. Now these are the emerging technologies. And believe me, friends, you can use blockchain. I'm not telling just cryptocurrency, I'm telling blockchain as a technology can be used in all of this. Okay. Now there is something called as a fault tolerance. You might you might ask me that, sir, how can uh, blockchain be used in plasma propulsion? How can blockchain be used in self-driving cars? Let me tell you, there is something called as fault tolerance. Okay. Now there is a computer which is which is uh, which is running one rocket. Okay, which is driving a rocket. When this computer is flying a rocket, imagine someone hacked into that computer and destroyed that computer. What will happen to the rocket? The rocket will go off course and crash. Okay. Now imagine that computer is having a replica of itself in the same rocket or somewhere else. Even if this computer goes offline, its support system can kick in and then uh, keep flying the rocket. This is called as fault tolerance. Even if there's a fault in the system, the system will can still continue to function. So blockchain provides something called as high fault tolerance. There are uh, friends, there are blockchains which have been developed that even if 70% of the network is destroyed, okay, the system can still run with 30% of the network still functioning. So it can be used in all of these uh, systems. Non-fungible tokens, which is now a hot topic Imagine I have this watch with me. I can convert this watch into a digital avatar. Okay. And then I can uh, place it. I can put that watch for on rent. Okay. Or on sale on the blockchain. And someone can buy it. And it cannot be duplicated or copied because it is on the blockchain. That is exactly what is an NFT. When I convert it into a blockchain avatar, when I convert this 
uh, watch into a blockchain avatar it becomes a non fungible token you can do that to anything a painting a process even your own linkedin profile can be converted into an nft your facebook profile can be converted into an nft the metaverse as i said in the beginning of my discussion the metaverse is coming or in in simple terms the matrix is here the future is not far away friends when uh, you will be wearing uh, a vr goggle like this girl here and you will be attending your classes you will be going to party with your friends uh, you will be attending family functions you will be attending birthdays all on the metaverse recently on the metaverse i think uh, at a cost of uh, a million dollars or so a plot of land on the metaverse was bought it's it's virtual property right now you can build anything there you can give it on rent your avatars can be on rent there can live on rent you can get mail post on the on the metaverse so all kinds of features are possible and i think india is poised for a big leap in this sector because india is already a software super power and india can leverage its uh, uh, software skills in this area now when you when it comes to metaverse okay your plot of land on the metaverse or you have built a house on the metaverse what is the guarantee that your house cannot be copied by the click of a button to another place it can only be ensured if your house is built on the blockchain now the entire imagine this entire metaverse being coded on the blockchain okay and whatever transaction is happening it happens on the blockchain because it happens on the blockchain it cannot be copied or it cannot be forged or counterfeited so your house is unique for that blockchain and it has a unique identity your identity is protected and that's how metaverse becomes real the new space age imagine india Uh, i mean you need not imagine it will be a reality in the next few in the next coming decades india will have a colony on the moon and in the coming century india will have a colony on mars as an indian you you are all uh, uh, the younger generation it will happen in our own lifetimes you or your children or if no if not you or your children your grandchildren will some day go to the moon or mars when they go there what money will they be using you cannot use your 2000 rupee note on the moon why because the cost of taking the 2000 rupee note to the moon is an additional 1000 rupees okay so your 2000 rupees note it appears 2000 but its value will be 3000 how will you spend it you cannot take credit card to space because the cost of taking that much weight to space is very high so the best way is maybe uh, as far as what our uh, honorable finance minister has declared india might come out with a blockchain avatar of a rupee which can be used in outer space also okay and you can just need to do a transaction uh, from your device you need not even carry your mobile phone it might happen on your uh, uh, the astronaut as an astronaut who will be wearing a watch or who will be wearing many devices in that there will be a payment device and yeah you can just transfer the money without need to carry coins notes credit cards or plastic money renewable energy uh, i mean energy markets right now are shifting to the blockchain okay there are companies which have developed a kind of shoe that if you do jogging that energy will be saved and it will be recorded in the form of some cryptocurrency and then you can say and you can spend those cryptocurrencies on the crypto exchange okay you can spend those crypto assets in the crypto exchange now once you do that what happens your jogging is incentivized your exercises are incentivized and you are also adding to the renewable energy mix of the energy grid imagine you are having a solar uh, uh, solar panel at your home you can uh, sell that energy to the electricity grid convert it into a crypto asset okay and then trade it uh, or convert it into any kind of asset and then trade it today there is talk of shifting the stock market to the blockchain today we have you are all students of economics there is a t plus 2 settlement 
presently happening and i think from 25th of february it will be t plus 1 settlement but on blockchain you can have a real time settlement immediate it is not even t the settlement is not even t the settlement is like t0 i mean just at the next second it is settled energy credits uh, stock markets uh, derivatives commodities market they all have the potential to shift to the blockchain system of working so in the end in the analysis what does blockchain enable us to do in the present metaverse and the digital economic world time is money total monetization of matter and energy is possible everything can be monetized your mobile phone convert it into an nft your pen drive convert it into an nft your your profile you convert it into nft and you can trade it on the stock market you can trade it on the crypto exchange all sorts of possibilities are uh, probable or even possible so you can add value i mean uh, you have an idea you bring that idea to the real world and money will follow that is what digital economics allows you to do so remember friends at the end of the day digital economics does not mean that uh, uh, i mean money has to be earned in a certain way what happens is that you only need to value uh, you only need to add value and money will follow so value is the most important addition that you can do to society in the age of digital economics now uh, in short there are some mantras for life in the digital economy as per my experiences and uh, also to some of the uh, experts that i had talked to uh, uh, in the course of my life mantra number 1 learn coding in some form even basic knowledge build try to learn coding you have so many courses now available on the web you can learn some of it uh, be an expert in any kind of coding or even uh, any kind of application for example adobe photoshop also if you are expert in that you can add value in a in in a big manner second take time off all of you are right now in your learning phase once your learning phase is over you need to come into the employment market or you need to create employment many of you will go on to create startups many of you will go on to head the big companies so before you do that okay or even when you do that take some time off travel away from the beaten track see in the west and especially in countries like israel what happens is immediately after their education is over uh, a large majority of them travel the world for two months or three months okay uh, and when they do that they get some perspective in life so that is important why do you need perspective uh, you need perspective for point 3 you need perspective to find some purpose in life it's the most important otherwise you will be lost in this forest of computer course okay see machines will take care of everything from now on in the in in uh, another few years as i told you even the uh, groceries you need not do it yourself abhi to bahut sare log uh, flipkart amazon or grofers pe order kar rahe hain wo bhi nahi hoga because your machines will do it for you they will understand amazon will understand what you need and it will send it to your home okay and when you are not there your house robot will keep it in your fridge it will stack it all that you need all that you need to do is open your open up your mind and start thinking of newer ways of adding value to society so there are no hard and fast rules in the digital age and within the regulatory framework uh, that the uh, government and the law of the land provides from time to time you are free to pursue your goals the the gist of it is this aapko pehle 10 saal pehle aapko ek company banana tha to what what had what you should have done you had to roam around from pillar to post you had to go to this you should take this clearance that clearance bank ke paas jao ca ke paas jao today uh, it that process is made easy so much that uh, at a click of a button you can get listed on the stock exchange okay there still some work today okay in the next coming uh, coming years you need not even leave your office you need not even leave your home you can create your own company and you can uh, run it from i mean you can run it from your the comforts of your own and last but not the least be happy have a positive outlook because the world is coming to india we will soon be a 5 trillion dollar economy and uh, the world will be coming to india so i thank uh, uh, the organizers of this event for giving me a wonderful opportunity to discuss about this very cutting edge topic uh, 
uh, all of you can connect uh, to me uh, on my twitter handle at hagedekati which is given it uh, on the left uh, left lower corner of this screen and uh, uh, these are my works and uh, i continue to do research on blockchain and as much as possible uh, try to add value in whatever way i can thank you very much uh, thank you so much thank you so much for an extremely interesting answer and and Yeah, thank you so much, Karthik, for an extremely comprehensive and detailed analysis of the busy world of blockchain and metaverse, peppered with some valuable life lessons. Uh, we are certain that someone who's never been exposed to these terms must have definitely developed a significant level of acquaintance uh, with this area of study. Uh, now, I would like to invite Ishita to take over for a short Q and A session. Uh, Ishita, I hope you're here. And uh, yes, uh, thanks, Arava. Thank you so much, sir. That was indeed a very uh, captivating session. The audience is now requested to post any questions that they have. I'll read them out to uh, out for sir, uh, so that sir could answer those questions. Yeah, sure. It seems uh, they are taking time to ask a question, so I would take the opportunity to uh, pose one uh, query. Uh, with regard to India, uh, what is the uh, regulations that we are going to do, Dr. Karthik? Do we have any proper regulation in place now uh, to control, uh, you know, cryptos and bitcoins? <coughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's a, I think it's a very pertinent question in the uh, in the light of recent developments. Let me um, put certain things in perspective. As I had already discussed, see the the power of issuing a currency is the right of uh, the right of that particular government, that that uh, country's government. The rupee can only be issued by the government of India through the Reserve Bank of India. Okay, uh, no other uh, entity in the world can issue a rupee. Okay, that that will actually be a direct confrontation with the sovereign authority. and that is uh, that is against the law now similarly for the dollar the dollar can only be uh, issued by the us government and the euro which can be done by the european central bank now when you are saying currency that means it's a medium of exchange okay uh, so this term currency is the sovereign right of the government and i think uh, uh, the government has clarified that the term actually to be used is crypto assets this is number one it's an asset it's a digital asset like a software code okay and the you are uh, transacting or uh, exchanging that those assets and second one because of the speculative nature of the crypto asset market or cryptocurrency market as is known in the public but uh, uh, for all practical purposes and for ease of understanding we will continue to use cryptocurrency uh, uh, for the ease of discussion so now this crypto market for the crypto market what happens is there is lot of speculation as i said bitcoin is $60000 then next day $20000 then another day $30000 so there is lot of speculation and uh, the government has rightfully identified it as a speculative uh, venture and presently the honorable finance minister has imposed a 30% tax as of now and she has also said in many of the discussions that the government is working on a bill the experts are working on a bill and government is in the process of consultation and she has also uh, said if i remember right that somewhere sometime this year uh, there might be an attempt to uh, work out a crypto uh, bill uh, a block uh, blockchain or a crypto asset cryptocurrency regula regulatory bill so we should uh, wait to await it's awaited to see like what will be the uh, form of the bill whenever it takes shape until then uh, the present uh, regime is that it will be taxed under 30% and uh, the sovereign it's the sovereign right of the government to issue currency that has been clarified and these assets uh, will have to be uh, traded in or have to be dealt with at the risk of the owner the government has no uh, uh, i mean right now the government cannot take responsibility of it and people have to be aware
so this the government has clarified and also i think uh, in the area of advertisements there are a lot of elements in the uh, i mean uh, uh, in the market who are trying to milk the situation by uh, giving advertisements promising high returns so i think the government has also rightfully mentioned uh, that uh, these things need to be regulated and uh, people should not be taken for granted this is the present uh, 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 sta sta status of uh, the things and i think we should uh, be patiently wait and uh, watch uh, i mean how the government comes out with the regulation because the experts are uh, consulting and the government is consulting with the experts yeah thank you yeah uh, i think we have a question here what is the scope of blockchain and healthcare when it comes to developing countries like india right uh, hari priya uh, let me tell you uh, healthcare uh, healthcare mein blockchain kaise use hoga I, and i have two or three papers written on that also i, I myself am a medical doctor so uh, that has been my area of interest now health records now these various patients are having health records there is a health documentation process evidence based medicine mein there is a documentation process now when these health records are transcribed and uh, documented uh, blockchain has found use in the maintenance of these health records and because of the uh, Uh, maintenance of health records it can be used in the court as proof of existence so studies are still going on on this on how it can be utilized but i see a great future in this and uh, developing countries like india there is a lot of scope because india is a hub of medical tourism india is a hub of medical tourism and uh, imagine there is an american or a european treated in india and tomorrow they face some complications uh, when they go back to their home country and they sue the indian doctors here but if the documentation is proper and if it is on the blockchain the doctor can defend him himself or herself saying that i mean uh, we were proper in our treatment it actually provides a very good way of documentation so that is uh, how there are lot of scope for that now mr arjun asks is there a crypto bubble that's likely to burst uh, <coughs> see now it's very uh, it's a very uh, uh, dicey thing to answer i will tell you why because we don't know if it's a bubble we don't know if it's a bubble okay all of you i think uh, uh, bramaredi uh, bramaredi sir i think all of them are students of economics here yeah, all, yes all, sir. all of you yes yeah, sir yeah. okay okay so uh, all of you are aware of the tulip crisis that had happened the tulip bubble that had happened in uh, uh, netherlands okay 400 years ago the tulip bubble was a bubble because it was known that the tulip does not have any use apart from its beauty aspect okay but it's not like that with cryptocurrencies we are still exploring the use cases okay i myself have given 17 use cases of blockchain which are being implemented in in various phases across the world i mean not only me other researchers also have also given now some experts are also of the opinion that we have entered a bubble which is a 100 or 150 year bubble i mean a, a tulip bubble was for i think 2 or 3 years but this bubble might be 100 or 150 years old but we are not sure even if it's a bubble so is there a crypto bubble that's likely to burst now if you consider it a bubble you should not enter it because uh, you know you are thinking it's a bubble but uh, if you are uh, very much Uh, strong on the value proposition and you are aware that okay i can i have i can add value to this uh, to the society by working on blockchain then it's not a bubble so it's it's quite subjective uh, divya rawat asks can blockchain be used outside the cryptocurrency field definitely definitely in fact the biggest use of blockchain outside the cryptocurrency field is in the area of certification it's in the as i said in uh, imagine there is a case in court there is a criminal case and the police have some evidence okay imagine there's a murder and the police have uh, documented all the evidence the knife was there at the spot and all of that stuff all of that has been photographed examined and the records have been placed on the blockchain tomorrow the judge can directly access the blockchain and uh, make sure that yes this evidence is not been tampered with because this evidence was documented on the blockchain so the status of that evidence cannot be tampered with this is just one of the examples there are several examples outside the cryptocurrency field 
and uh, even uh, the government of india also has encouraged blockchain uh, if you go back to the 2017 18 budget uh, if if i am remembering it right uh, the honorable finance minister at that time had said that blockchain as a technology will be encouraged by the government Whereas cryptocurrencies will be regulated, or they will be, uh, I mean, uh, a framework will be given for them. Are cryptocurrencies another form of fiat currency, or do they have any intrinsic value like gold? There are two questions here. Aditya Anand Jha is asking: Are cryptocurrencies another form of fiat? No, cryptocurrencies are not fiat currencies. Fiat currencies are only uh, given issued by the government of that particular country. Or do they have any intrinsic value? Again. i ask you you are a student of economics what is the definition of intrinsic value okay uh, imagine this is imagine this is a this is a item made of gold okay for a monk a gold and stone are of no i mean they hold the same significance okay for him what is uh, the intrinsic value of gold it may be nothing but for a businessman the value of gold might be what's the what is its value in market so now it's subjective again how the intrinsic value of gold how does gold get its intrinsic value it's again subjective because it is shining it is valuable it takes a lot of energy to mine gold okay but it takes a lot of energy to mine diamond also it takes a lot of energy to mine uh, iridium or uh, uh, or radium it takes a lot of energy to mine copper but they all have have diff differing values okay now again it's subjective and as, as i said it's market based abhinav mankotia asks the metaverse is a private entity creating a digital landscape that could even be considered a sovereign entity is it reasonable to leave it up to individual players like facebook to control an entire digital economy what would a nationalized metaverse look like <coughs> a very very insightful question i must say abhinav uh, uh, very insightful okay metaverse is private what abhinav says is metaverse is private but is it possible that metaverse may itself become a separate country in its own right okay or is it reasonable to leave it to individuals like facebook uh you are far ahead of your time abhinav this is too early a time to uh, ask this question but uh, well, let us see let, let us discuss metaverse kya hai you are a creator you are creating a metaverse okay a bigger entity creates a digital world like the matrix okay now is that metaverse a country in its own right tomorrow that means if it's a country uh it can also wage wars it can also issue its own currency it can also tax its citizens it can also uh, do everything that a government does Uh, this will have to be sorted out by the global community maybe at the united nations level or at a at a at a supranational level uh, this is a really uh, uh, a topic of debate and uh, the answer to this is not as simple as it appears and in the light of this in the light of this we cannot allow mono companies to have a monopoly on the metaverse it's very clear it's very clear because people's livelihoods might be affected tomorrow there might be people who might be working on the metaverse you are wearing a vr set going to work on the metaverse and if your rights there are affected will they be the same thing as the rights affected in the uh, uh, real world so all of these are points of debate and i think uh, uh, the university and the college can actually add a lot of value to this debate taking it further this is a good area of research abhinav and i think you should take it up alok kumar kanojia asks how does the price of cryptocurrency is determined it is determined by the market presently there are crypto exchanges and uh, there is a buy and sell table just like in the stock market there is for equity you have uh, and the prices are uh, based uh, or they are discussed uh, i mean they are uh, uh, traded on that front and uh, the prices are arrived at is individual raghav puri asks is individual like elon musk influence over cryptocurrencies a problem doesn't it make more volatile and more risk prone should an average investor invest in the cryptocurrency is the government right to impose 30% tax on crypto 
okay he asks are individuals like elon musk over cryptocurrency a problem that is the problem of cryptocurrencies that is not the problem of individuals see if the value of something can fluctuate before because of some person giving a statement that means it's not stable enough people still have confusion in their minds regarding that particular asset so on this front that's why the government is regulating it and the government has taken a view that uh, uh, it's a speculative uh, venture uh, rightly so i think rightly so and uh, to protect the interest of the people and also to stop this speculation people from losing their hard earned savings there's a deterrent and also if you are making insane profits out of it uh, the society should uh, have a share of it just like in any other speculative venture and uh, that's why the government has imposed 30% tax so i mean the organizers may please uh, let me know if there is that if the time has been overshot or uh, i mean if if there is time for the uh, discussion or uh, i mean uh, i hope we are not overshot the time ishita uh, uh, no sir it's perfectly fine so there is a there is a last question in the chat box if you could answer yeah. that yes yes so antariksh sandeepan asks is it an asset or a currency or is it a security as some consider it one uh, as per the present uh, i mean uh, the work that has happened and also the uh, uh, the regulatory frameworks and all who, which are which are in the process of being formed cryptocurrency is actually an asset it is uh, for all technical purposes an asset and not a currency because it is not issued by a sovereign authority so it is an asset is it a security as some consider it as one again it's debatable uh, whether it's a security or not because security uh, compared to asset have some uh, differences but as of now uh, it's considered an asset whether it's a security or not the debate is still on yeah i think that was the last question uh, a lot of questions i think uh, i mean uh, i'm very happy that uh, so many uh, people are having so many queries on uh, crypto assets and blockchain yeah i, I hand it over to the organizers yes. thank you so much uh, thank you so much uh, thank you so much sir for answering the questions it cleared a lot of our doubts and uh, thank you for sharing such vast knowledge with us in the changing face of economics it is very important to stay updated and we got to learn so much from you sir thank you so much now i would li uh, like to hand it over to yash for uh, taking the session forward yeah yash uh, is amit yes, is sir? amit ja oh uh, i'm not sure sir so uh, i'm here yeah. amit ja supposed to give vote of thanks i think dr kartik may have some other engagements he would leave okay 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 no issue dr. no issue kartik, i think it's, I just... it's up to you dr kartik if you wish to continue we will be happy if you have some other engagements you may proceed uh yeah i mean uh, uh i mean if the uh, process i mean if the ceremonial process is done with the i mean if i have the time uh, uh i will go through the other presentations also and uh, i have another meeting slated at 11 so i still have 10 15 minutes so it's not okay i think uh, amit are you there amit yeah yeah i'm here sir yeah 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 you can uh, propose vote of thanks for this uh, you know keynote uh, you know address uh okay uh, so uh, absolutely uh, it's an honor to propose the vote of thanks uh, on behalf of department of uh, economics as well as the economic association of uh, sri venkateshwara college today on the second day of a uh, uh, festival called bless point uh, i would like to uh, thank our keynote speaker mr kartik who despite his busy schedule found time to grace this occasion Uh, sir we learnt a lot uh, even i am new to this blockchain technology and cryptocurrency probably uh, i hope that the students as well as the teaching fraternity have learnt a lot from you as well as the question answers round was quite interesting uh, sir it's an absolute uh, honor to have you here sir thanks thanks a lot sir for coming the pleasure is mine yeah thank yeah. you very much dr kartik uh, as i have shared with uh, some of you about dr kartik presently he is uh, involved in a mission mode project on human resource management at the level of government of india you find something very interesting about him he is uh, you know a medical doctor by qualification and a civil servant by you know his uh, uh, choice or you know his profession 
and he works extensively on blockchain technology. So it's a, I would say, versatile, you know, personality. And uh, I had the first opportunity to meet him at ISTM, uh, I think in 2018-19. Then he mentioned that, you know, he's working uh, on blockchain technology. And I was able to recall my conversation with him. And uh, the theme of the festival is such that we wanted a person like you, Dr. Karthik. And I'm so happy to see you, uh, you know, in your uh, full swing. Uh, in 45 minute time, you know, you have uh, given us, uh, you know, the from basics to that of uh, the future of this Bitcoins and uh, black technology. As you know, our students, some of them are from science background, so they would have understood better than, you know, others because it's all about, uh, you know, uh, technology and uh, specific to the computers technology. And we wish that, uh, you know, as and when you find time, uh, you would be able to spend, uh, you know, uh, with our students your valuable time uh, to give them some direction and, uh, you know, mentoring. Uh, thank you very much uh, on behalf of the uh, management of the SV College and uh, the Economics Association. I express my sincere gratitude for taking, uh, you know, very uh, valuable time of yours out and give uh, it to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I thank uh, the college uh, faculty and the organizers for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, proceed with the other speaker. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. So moving on, we are delighted to receive Mr. Siddharth Dalmia. Mr. Dalmia is the founder of a stealth startup which provides decentralized digital asset management as a service. He completed his education from the prestigious Dhirubhai Ambani Institute of Information and Communication Technology and then went on to pursue a law degree from OP General Global University. He specializes in blockchain technology and is also the founder of Wealthsy, well, I'm sorry, Wealthile, I'm, uh, I'm sorry for the error, Wealthile, a content management company. Previously, he... Uh, he worked as a law associate in a in transactions at the uh, in this law firm, established multiple companies, and has also cleared a CFA level two exam. We welcome you, sir. Thank you for joining us today, and I'm sure our students are eager to hear about your amazing journey. Hey, uh, so first of all, am I visible to everyone? Uh, is my camera on or is it visible? Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I don't think camera is visible. There's a logo of uh, of your uh, uh, showing. Okay. Yeah, now it's visible. Yeah, it's visible now. Okay. Yeah. Hi, hi everyone. So, uh, yes, I have worked extensively on blockchain technology. I have been involved in this space since uh, 2015. Uh, I was a student like you when I made my first investment in Bitcoin. And uh, this particular space kept on growing, and obviously. Uh, Today, it has become a $2.7 trillion economy at its peak, I think. So let us discuss what this revolution is all about, legality behind it, and actually how to value them. You can, you can uh, ask all, all your questions at the end of this pre particular presentation. Uh, can I get... Yes, I have it. Yeah, my screen is visible, right? Yes, sir, your screen is visible, sir. Uh, it says blockchain and its application. True. So let us start with it. I do not know why it's not working. So what is the value of blockchain technology or all these de digital assets that coming up uh, th that we keep hearing about? It's the first time on the internet you can actually own things. Before that, they were owned through a domain. They were uh, owned by a company. They were owned by different people. But truly for the first time, we can own things like say Bitcoin that we talk about. 
so bitcoin is on blockchain so what is blockchain how do you uh, how do you explain what the blockchain is and why is it owned by the community that is the main question so satoshi nakamoto wrote several problems with the existing economic structure or uh, how it has evolved over the years so he said that okay sovereigns have the power to mint unlimited currencies or unlimited fiat and this power should not be with the government but with the people and then he came up with his white paper on uh, bitcoin that we have all heard about now what exactly is bitcoin so how how what is the significance of bitcoin so it is just a piece of software uh, that you run on your computer earlier there was there like today it's also there are central authorities like banks or say amazon M amazon or like e commerce marketplace on or any other entity that you can think of what is their main purpose they maintain ledgers for us so basically we pay bank their transaction fees etc to maintain those ledgers satoshi nakamoto comes and tells okay we do not need uh, need to do this so anyone who runs a particular software they can maintain the ledgers and they would be rewarded in bitcoins so suppose there are three people x y z so they start maintaining this ledger system so how how so suppose x owes y uh, two bitcoins y owes z two bitcoins and z owes uh, x uh, one bitcoin so basically all these transactions have to be computed compiled and a ledger has to be maintained the same way the bank uh, does to our account uh, this is how the money is transferred so he's wrote a code in such a way so that in every 10 minutes in every in every 10 minutes there would be a block that would be created that would have the database of uh, all the transactions that took place and compute them okay so finally x x wallet owns say one bitcoin or uh, minus one bitcoin in this case and the bitcoin actually cannot go to negative but this is it is same as how uh, ledger so for maintaining those ledgers maybe for people outside the system who are not running the software who just have wallet access or just validating those transaction people are awarded in bitcoin so initially for as and everyone so how is this bitcoin awarded everyone is trying to solve a particular puzzle presented to their computer system every computer system connected to this particular network that is called node is trying to solve a puzzle and this particular puzzle who have whichever computer is successful is awarded in uh, in bitcoin every computer is maintaining those nodes those uh, ledgers and that is how they become part of this ecosystem and initially you used to be about awarded 5 uh, 50 bitcoins then it got reduced to 25 then it got reduced to 6.25 then it got it will be reduced or it got reduced to 3.125 and so on and so forth and that is why we say that bitcoins are limited the reward for solving that puzzle would keep on decreasing and because now it is a geometric progression uh, puzzle so many of you being science and com uh, economic student might understand what geometric progression is so initially if something is 50 then 25 then 12.5 it's halving that this event happens every 4 years it is embedded in the software and this is called bitcoin halving that you might have heard about so that is why there can only be 21 million bitcoins as uh, as this if you solve this particular geometric progression now satoshi nakamoto also told that because these uh, these countries have like infinite power to uh, mint these uh, fiat currencies there will be uh, inflationary issues there and like 
the government can restrict you for make for making any sort of purchases and that is what we are actually witnessing today so let us break it down let us take the case study of canada for example you might have heard about these uh, uh, this protest by uh, truck drivers in uh, canada so but do you understand what they have done the thing is they have freezed all the accounts who were participants to this particular uh, protest imagine this happening in india when farmer uh, protests were taking place and suddenly uh, our government comes in intervenes and says that okay whoever is uh, in those protests they cannot access their uh, bank accounts anymore it does not make sense right the second event that followed was uh, this like whoever donated to the cause they also got their bank account freeze does it make sense to you do you think that government should be telling me uh, whether i should uh, i should protest and these were like peaceful protests whether i, I should protest or not or uh, where if i should donate to the cause or not and if they can freeze your bank accounts any time now people are understanding the value of these crypto assets that okay so if government can freeze them let us not accept crypto at all this happened in turkey because of completely different reason uh, that we might discuss but this is the power of bitcoin this is the power of owning things on internet because no one can track these nodes who is running this so this particular software who is being rewarded in bitcoin so there is uh, so this truly become decentralized uh, in a way so that governments cannot uh, totally regulate them totally ban them and obviously governments hate it but still this is it, internet gave a lot of power to people right and if we think uh, about uh, nakamoto's vision if people take away this power to mint currency and transact on internet only then it takes away a lot of it gives a lot of power to the people the common man like yourself and i and it takes it takes a lot of power away from the government let us take the uh, example of el salvador may and maybe other uh, african and latin american countries whose currency do not hold any value in most of the cases they kept printing their currency so they so essentially maybe you own say 1 trillion xy units of xyz currency but you cannot even purchase a piece uh, a, a loaf of bread from that imagine that people carrying bundles and bundles of money and they cannot do anything with it El Salvador came ahead and solved this issue. He said, "Okay, like uh, we do not trust U.S. dollar. We do not trust any other uh, fiat currency, and so we make Bitcoin the legal tender. And this was like this was envisaged by these Bitcoin enthusiasts and Nakamoto uh, way back in the past. So, after like studying." these case studies you must have learned about inflation like uh, okay so let me give you a very simple but significant example before 2020 covid crisis if us uh, economy had printed say 100 dollars in the economy suppose that there were only 100 dollars inside the economy today there are 140 dollars in the economy that is 40% of the money in the whole civ human civilization inside in us that is used as the benchmark is printed in last two years try digesting that what happens to the purchasing power of a common man rich becomes richer poor becomes poorer and like it creates a lot of issues which uh, we might face in the future we see uh, basic commodity prices rising we see oil prices rising and uh, we the thing is we never learn governments would keep on uh, like printing the money and they think that it is unlimited power but it is it is an invisible tax on your pockets it's basically 6% 
average in India in this year, year on uh, the last uh, sorry, the last quarter year on year inflation for US was 7.5%, which is very, very unreasonable. So now that you are familiar with the basic concept of Bitcoin and uh, basics of the blockchain technology, the functioning that I described how Bitcoin functions, it it is the blockchain technology. Every system runs a particular software. They try to maintain those ledgers and uh, maybe some other code. So this I described proof of work uh, and uh, proof of work is the mechanism that I described and it is uh, the most basic mechanism of blockchain technology, uh, but we'll we'll get to it later if we have time. The ultimate thing is digital assets like cryptocurrencies are giving a lot of power to people. Then you might ask, OK, so if this is I understand what cryptocurrency is, what is Ethereum or what is NFT? Because these become very, very significant when we are uh, discussing this uh, subject matter and uh, like there is a point to discuss all of this. Ethereum is like what C or Java was to Web 2.0. Ethereum is that to Web 3.0. It helps you code these uh, protocols. It helps you code these blockchains. If you have read any white papers, if you have read uh, anything about cryptocurrencies or crypto assets or the projects that are coming up or cropping up, uh, you would see that they basically use Ethereum. Its core language is called Solidity. It's just like JavaScript with some uh, additional function and everything is coded on it. You might ask, so I won't get into technicals of it, but it is important for you to understand basics. So this is basics like uh, Ethereum, uh, Ethereum solidity is like Java or C to our uh, this blockchain infrastructure. Now you uh, so using ethereum you can code something which is called nft non-fungible token what is nft nft is basically uh, it it acts as a pointer so imagine that okay so uh, there is a, uh, so there is a piece of paper that you might own and it points to a certain address suppose uh, my home or a university classroom anywhere it you have that piece of paper is nft which is in a tokenized form and this particular point pointer to the address is might be my home or your classroom this piece of paper is an immutable proof that you own what is inside this particular uh, as in this particular location. This is NFT. Basically, it is a pointer to a particular location, which uh, through blockchain you can confirm that whether uh, it has uh, what it has. So this particular room uh, where I'm sitting might be considered um, like you might hold a piece of paper and you might actually own the own the contents essentially own the contents of this room and you would see a lot of things. And because of blockchain, this is verified what this particular room owns. And uh, NFT token is the key to this particular room. So it has two purposes. One, it's the proof of ownership. That's why it is the key. Second, it points to this particular room, actually where this particular room exists. So it happens on the internet. Basically, it points to a particular server and contents of the server are owned by essentially owned by the NFT owners. That's why you it, it using this particular uh, blockchain technology uh, using Ethereum for the first time in human history, you are able to own assets on the internet. Think about the power of that. And this is just the beginning. NFT, now NFT is being uh, so there is a project in USA called Landshare. This uh, through this particular NFT uh, or basically blockchain technology tokenization mechanics, you can own a piece of you can actually you cannot 
technically own the a piece of land or real estate in US, but you can actually invest in it, which is very powerful. It gives tremendous returns. It is a, a nice investment. And if you cannot spend say seven hundred thousand dollars or maybe millions of dollars yourself, you can essentially do it through blockchain and it is a trust trusty uh, this thing. Uh, it creates trust without actually people knowing about each other. As uh, Mr. Karthik had said before, uh, like uh, he talked about powerful blockchain technologies are being created. So uh, one of the example is Avalanche, which actually needs. So how do you hack Bitcoin network? Let me tell you. So you need 51% computing power to hack that. That is essentially half the supercomputers across Earth right now. So basically to hack it, you would require 51% of the total uh, this computational power uh, or hash power, which uh, which might be used, to, uh, which might be used to fake those ledgers. But the technology has improved drastically. You can read more about it. Uh, so on Avalanche, you need actually 80% power and I won't get into details of it or technicals of it, uh, but this is the case. There seems to be one single problem with the government. Government would let you trade in uh, commodity in futures market, even if you do not understand them. And uh, but government does not want you to trade in cryptocurrencies. Why? Government has one of the biggest powers that we have subconsciously given to them. What is that power? That is the power to print the money. And essentially, if these become popular, they won't be able to print that and they would lose the power. They but I believe that uh, and this is a personal opinion that people would adjust. So if uh, an algorithm is minting out the tokens and it is not being decided by say RBI or maybe any central authority for that matter, the economy would adjust itself and uh, like it would act more rationally. They, and it's just a personal opinion. We can talk about it in Q&A session. So this is a brief about digital assets. What is legality of it? There are traditional contracts. There are smart contracts. This has been in a very uh, lucrative term or very a buzzword. Uh, these smart contracts these days. Let us understand what they mean. So traditional contracts is everything uh, that is written down on the piece of paper and you basically uh, go notarize it and basically our uh, whole system has a way to enforce these particular contracts. If it does not get enforced, you go to judiciary and they do it on your behalf and we have seen how good this system works. I am a lawyer. Uh, when you go to court, you would actually understand uh, the irony behind justice. Uh, it, 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 it is not happening. It is delayed. It, it is slow. But what about smart contract? It's, it's a piece of code written on, say, Ethereum blockchain or maybe Solana, etc. You again, you can read more about it, but let, we will only take the example of Ethereum because it was the first one and uh, I think you would be able to understand the basics of it. So it is a piece of code written on uh, Ethereum Solidity, which actually enforces uh, contracts in a very uh, automatic way. So this is a self executing computer program uh, once certain conditions are met. So there is no, there has to be no human intervention. There has to be no uh, judicial intervention because the settlement has already taken place. And the code itself, because it is on blockchain, you can take my word for it. Uh, and if it breaks, basically our whole banking infrastructure, security infrastructure would break. This code is immutable once it is on blockchain. And it cannot be tampered with. 
and uh, this is what creates really powerful projects. So let me give you an example. So right, like it is. So it is a very basic example, base, very basic use case that is into debt industry. So what happens till now? You get a credit score. I, this is like I am trying to explain traditional economy with the smart blockchain based economy using uh, say smart uh, smart contracts and blockchain technology. So these what happens to these? Uh, so when I need loan, I have a civil score. That civil score would be reflected on the bank's uh, database. I do not know how they decide whether to issue a card to me or whether to issue a loan to me even if when I have as even when I might have assets. So basically there are obviously algorithms which are not revealed to you. You do not like I am not hundred like you can never be certain what kind of civil score you have and uh, why and you can think that it might be a good one, but it might turn out to be bad bad one and then you go to bank you ask for say loan I need one crore INR loan they give you a piece of paper where you sign the documents where you pledge your uh, maybe real estate or gold or whatever and you take the money and get away with it. But if you read about projects like Aave or Avalanche it becomes much more interesting. It is actually in incredible. It is done through smart contracts you might own certain digital assets. So right now think of it as a technology which is at this, at the stage of infancy. It might not hold real. You might not be able to hold ownership of real assets on blockchain, but definitely it is the future and it would be done through the NFT technology that we discussed previously. But uh, you I might own 10 Bitcoins right now and say uh, one gala note or uh, or whatever. So this makes my crypto assets worth around 4.5 crores. Now these uh, in, by going to this uh, loan uh, disbursement platforms, uh, whether it be Aave or uh, or Anchor. Basically, I give them a proof that I own these assets and there are ways to do that. And they issue stable coins automatically. What are stable coins? So they, the most popular example of stable coin is say uh, USDT, that is US dollar tether. And uh, it will its value would always be pegged to one US dollar, and that's how uh, th there is a whole parallel economy in this particular digital asset management world. Uh, but let's not get into it. Uh, basically, if you have 4.5 crores of uh, tokens you can avail uh, 4.5 crores of digital assets you can avail loans for 60 percent of that value uh, there are challenges to that as well this all the systems are not pro, uh, perfect but this you need to understand this particular ecosystem is only 12 years old and you can actually take loans by just uh, leveraging or mortgaging your digital assets uh, so it and this is done through smart contracts. So you lock your uh, assets or collaterals on a smart contract. So suppose uh, market falls by certain limit, then your uh, the smart contract. So this is the condition. So say if market falls by say 80 percent, then or 70 percent, your uh, crypto holding holdings or these digital assets that you logged in your smart contract would be sold automatically in the market. So this is an example of smart contract which is uh, which is very uh, which is used frequently and that's why people say that this whole system is collateralized or over leveraged but uh, that is an, again a debate for another day. Now my friends, let us talk about what it, so is Bitcoin a legal tender? Many people say that okay, so this is cryptocurrency, so it's a currency, and that's why it must be tender. 
so you can see my screen over here so i have said i have asked this question and i have been asked this plenty of times as to uh, how do you categorize these digital assets or cryptocurrencies are they security are they currency are they coin or something else? i'll be very direct these are very specific terms these are assets that are highly regulated and they they are defined in the present statutes so if you go to security laws there would be some uh, some document by cb and they would say okay so we would consider x y z a b c as security and we have a document by rbi or and center uh, and and basically these are called statutes uh, in case you are not familiar with legal jargon statutes are basically bare acts bare act means uh, there is a codified version of laws uh, so there you might have heard about uh, ipc that uh, or uh, code of civil procedure or indian contract act and these statutes would define what these things are and bitcoin or digital asset do not fall under any of these categories so how do you interpret them you interpret them using existing co codes that are there they might not do it directly but there might be some indirect uh, interpretation so for example there is an act called foreign exchange management act i would get to kyc and aml in just a bit but let me deal with this fema issue so foreign exchange management act what it does it regulates the movement of assets cross border so if i want to bring in us dollars from outside and i want to accept payments in us dollars from outside india uh, or i want to import certain goods from outside india they would be regulated by fema fema has a very interesting mentioning of a word whenever it deals with this cross border uh, transaction that is assets and basic definition of assets is anything that holds value so do cryptocurrencies own hold any value true and do cryptocurrencies hold any sort of uh, like are can they be classified as assets that's the main question although it has no like uh, the uh, question is still open ended under fema that word asset includes cryptocurrencies so basically you so basically they derive uh, their legitimacy or definition from them so now uh, but there is another issue we are talking about blockchain here so there might be a node a computer that is running that bitcoin software in india in us in taiwan in china uh, in russia all over the world so how do you determine so normally how jurisdiction is determined is where are the servers located or where is the company located and we would determine the jurisdiction in this case everything is on nodes how do you determine the jurisdiction in this particular case you can't so how does fema come into play so basically when but the wallet owner or address owner can be verified so suppose i want to send certain bitcoins to a person in us he would have a wallet address or account details so that i can actually make the transfer just like you have account number in bank you would have a, a wallet address here so i might want to send that to his or her wallet now the thing is when i sent them there i have basically transferred assets so transfer of assets it's there so how do i determine about the territorial issue i would say that because this that particular account or uh this particular uh, yes account is owned by a person outside india it is cross border transaction and that is why there is a lot of issue and that is the reason you see a lot of arbitrage in india uh, if you have ever dealt with cryptocurrencies you would see that in us if, we, if there is uh, cryptocurrencies are like 8% 
7% and maybe 12 to 15% on volatile days cheaper. So if say a Bitcoin cost 1 crore in India, it will cost say 90 lakhs, 92 lakhs or maybe 85 lakhs in US. I have personally seen Bitcoin being traded at two third of its value uh, between India and US. And this is the reason because when you are uh, because of these FEMA guidelines, it is impossible for a company to legitimately obtain bitcoins without paying a GST or taxes on it. And uh, that is why there is arbitrage uh, over there. The next problem is you might have heard about, so I'm blabbering about this blockchain technology, that blockchain technology, but it is very difficult for a common man to access it. So there is a software called MetaMask and it is just like a locker that you have. And there is a key to that locker and it is a string of 12 words. And that is your identity on blockchain and I'm not even kidding about it. You can actually just download it, experience it. Uh, it, it holds your crypto asset. It holds your digital identity without any KYC, without any AML and only a 12 word string is uh, proof of the ownership. So if I lose that 12 word string, you lose your crypto assets, your digital assets. And that's why you see that people crib about losing certain keys and this might be considered a very uh, like basic example of the same. Essentially, now what I can do with this particular this power power tool. I can own US dollar tether that we talked about. It is a stable coin. It is its value is always back to uh, US dollar. I can hold them in my MetaMask wallet. If I ever want to transact, I would never use Paytm or Fiat account. I would ask someone else to give me their MetaMask wallet ID or their Bitcoin address or whatever. And I would transfer them there. There are a lot of issues over there. Firstly, I do not know to whom I have given the money. Secondly, how do you pay taxes on this transaction? And what if someone wants to avoid those taxes? And this was happening frequently. So the uh, FEMA, the arbitrage issue that okay so bitcoins are more expensive in india this was happening in india and uh, it had lots of issues in it and there is a lip uh, liberalized remittance scheme uh, lrs scheme that is provided by government of india so that i can uh, just send my money outside india in a very easy manner because of this crypto arbitrage uh, like rbi imposed five percent tcs like uh, Above seven lakh, if uh, seven lakh INR, if I were to transfer anything outside, they would withhold five percent of that. Imagine that, like how it is changing the structure. Initially, RBI was like, okay, so we don't care what it is, and then uh, back in 2013, just be careful. And today, they are actually uh, at least acknowledging this particular system. So. Uh, there are exchanges operating in India. There are various ways of legal interpretation. So what I interpret of these exchanges, they are like e-commerce platform which are just selling you like a, uh, a box of dates or pencils or pens or balls, anything that you might purchase on uh, e-commerce platform. So they do not, they currently do not have any specified regulation. There are two which we would be focusing on which have been promulgated by and the government of India and SKI. The first one is taxation. This is the worst regulation ever. I firmly am not in favor of this. I particularly do not like this stance. It will hinder uh, India's technological growth as well as the adoption in Bitcoin space. So every capital gain is 30%, which is reasonable. Like we can agree on that, but there is a problem. So if I am transacting in two particular cryptocurrencies, one being say Ethereum, one being say Bitcoin, and I make say capital gain. So there is currency trading, right? Like you would be aware that, okay, you can trade US currencies, you can trade 
um, great britain pound you can trade euro so similarly you can trade uh, cryptocurrencies as well it is in the stages of uh, infancy so there would be a lot of volatility associated with it but it would die down uh, eventually uh, now government says if i have two particular transaction per two particular uh, transactions one in uh, bitcoin and one in ethereum and i made one lakh in bitcoin and i lost one lakh in ethereum i have to pay taxes on one lakh which i made on bitcoin and i cannot offset with my losses on ethereum trading if it is share market they talk about the whole portfolio and it is taxed uh, like that only why are you taxing it like that i do not understand this this might seem irrational to you but this is what the law is and again like let's not get into detail of the other taxes so first is uh, tds uh 1% would be uh, withheld as a tax detected at source on every transaction in india and uh, last we already talked about tcs let us uh, divulge a bit in gst as well so whenever i so if i'm importing uh crypto assets i might have to pay gst if so uh, technically speaking this is very very technical if uh, essentially i am trading on uh, exchanges outside india it is in very technical sense it you might be committing an offense under sema but there is no way to uh, way to identify that so the governments can't actually regulate it but it is what it is but what if i want to bring bitcoins in my indian wallet i have to categorize it as something so if you categorize it as say software then it is 18% uh, other goods 18% so your gst would range from 12 to 18% ranging uh, depending on the way you have classified it and that's why there is, this is another reason this gst is another reason why there is a lot of arbitrage as i came up with and uh, with another uh, circular recently it was like 3 to 4 days back i guess so as i said okay so whenever you are displaying uh, the ads related to cryptocurrencies you have to put certain disclaimer in my you cannot show minors making gains from it etc etc so uh, when we are seeing uh, when we watch movies so there is a disclaimer so all the characters are fictional there is no re resemblance to the real world characters uh there is no infringement of copyright laws to the best of their knowledge whatever and they have to post similar notice so it means that even sk is recognizing that okay so we can't regulate it we can't uh, sorry if the government is not coming up with the stance then let us just put certain guidelines on it and it made a lot of sense uh, so with respect to how these are advertised this should be strictly regulated uh the more the regulation the better but i still want to see how governments manage to regulate it and then lastly there is russian stance you might have heard a lot about russia's new laws so what they have done is they have, they have classified it as so this technically it is not the legal tender it they are treating it like a foreign currency so just like we treat say russian ruble japanese yen or us dollar so they are treating a cryptocurrency in similar manner so it's, they are saying that okay we would treat it as foreign currency and it it has its own uh, set of benefits uh, this was basic next we have nfts copyright so uh, so there is copyright law you might be aware of it so if i draw something so this particular slide that you are watching or this particular video that this college is rec uh, recording this is all protected through this copyright law so once you buy an nft the question is do you own the copyright to the art behind it or anything maybe metaverse behind it the answer is no there are specific clauses with respect to it and you have to transfer these rights in writing and therefore technically you do not get the copyright so it's like owning a painting once you own a so i create a painting and i it, like you pay me money and it goes to you so you might own the painting but do you own its copyright answer is no 
and similar thing is happening with in nft space so technically copyright is not owned by nft holder there are a lot of issues with respect to identity and personal data on meta where someone might steal your identity or might come might come to know about your real world identity and create a lot of problems so uh, there is this classic movie which everyone keeps referring to you might have watched it that is ready player one and there you remember the lead hero's identity being revealed in metaverse and she led to real world consequences hopefully we don't get to see that kind of world but how do you protect your identity and personal data in metaverse it's it's a completely diff it's a very tough question to answer but if it is built on uh, the, on blockchain technology the data is already pseudo anonymous you don't have to do much about it and that's why we see a growth of these decentralized uh, metaverses whether it be decentralized sandbox somnium space etc and they are great projects unlike facebook's metaverse which is tra tracking everything i do they can't do that and everyone owns those and that is where you get prop metaverse property rights real estate rights from but again different issue content moderation how do you create uh, how do you moderate content so if uh, so i create an nft and say that okay this is adidas nft or this is spider-man from marvel or venom from marvel i love those characters and i'm just going ahead and uh, minting those nfts so how do you moderate these in this content recently i purchased uh, advertisement rights in um, in a metaverse called blocktopia and there is open c uh, platform open op and sea through which you can actually purchase these uh, nfts or uh, real estates or these rights and actually there were fake profiles of blocktopia which were selling real estate in blocktopia and i was like wow it is just for say to eat or something like that and i said that i would purchase them but then there are ways to identify it through their contact uh, so smart contract address like every smart contract has an address you can verify the validity of the same using uh, smart contracts you could say okay so this is so I, I clicked on it and i came to know that this is a sham and they were basically selling fake metaverse real estate blocktopia real estate by creating fake ids and it becomes very hard to moderate these kind of uh, uh, this kind of content there might be a person who makes an nft out of say prada but how does Pro prada sue them how does prada decipher their identity so just a food for thought there there is specific so i think i'm taking a lot of time so i would be very quick so there is uh, you have to plan your corporate structure you want to move to crypto friendly jurisdiction whether it be malta whether it be say uh, switzerland or any other friendly jurisdiction that you might want to go to uh, we have talked about hawala transactions uh, that i move just move uh, usdt outside india how do you track it etc gambling and regulatory scrutiny if i am creating an ecosystem which lets you gamble your money place your bets and you are basically exchanging tokens it's not on internet it's on web 3.0 infrastructure and basically uh, you settle everything through those chips how do you track that sexual harassment case that happened in uh, facebook's meta you might have heard about it so how do you deal with those issues facebook actually came up with this pay, safe space uh framework or if a safe space uh infra this what do you call this okay whatever space, safe space uh feature so that you can because of this particular sexual harassment case that have that took place in facebook's metaverse uh we i want to discuss decentralization of companies through dao decentralized autonomous organizations in detail i do not know whether i have time for that or not uh, there are slides which cover it in detail later and india is if india does not improve its law and i think it should become a crypto friendly jurisdiction it can have an immense opportunity it's like internet rebuilding from the scratch again and india can actually benefit a lot from it but they need to control they, they need to come up with nice regulations 
many of you are curious about valuing digital assets and uh, I have expertise in it. Uh, I think that I have expertise in it because this space is fairly new. No one knows about it. So let us understand first it demand and supply. This is the basic answer. OK, so like on uh, exchanges, you see fluctuations in demand and supply, but most of the companies have fundamentals as well, right? Like when I'm purchasing a stock, I would say, OK, so this is uh, th this had this much revenue, this had this much profit margin and uh, this uh, this is the growth rate. This industry is going at this rate and that's why I'm valuing and I'm, I, I'll assign a price to earning multiple to it. And I'll say that okay, this is fairly valued or not. But what so in blockchain space, like we talked about how blockchain works, how Bitcoin works. So every computer is generating, uh, is running that software. It is consuming a lot of computing power, a lot of electricity. So that is hash hash power basically. And we can actually calculate how much computer resources and how much electricity is required to mine one Bitcoin to actually get rewarded with one Bitcoin. And if we have those variables, it just becomes an equation, right? And you can actually value Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. So people who say that it is speculative, true it is speculative, but it has underlying fundamentals. I personally think that most of the, the these top projects that we keep hearing about, these are fairly valued. These are not overvalued, and that is why if someone says, "Are we in bubble?" I do not know. Uh, no one knows about bubble. If we would know that we are in bubble, then there would be no bubble burst because markets would price them very, very like the, like they, they would price them fairly. Just to give you a context. JP Morgan has purchased Bitcoin at a valuation of $50,000 average. And right now it is at $40,000. And JP Morgan seems to have valued Bitcoin at a much higher rate than the current. So we, according to investment banks, if we go purely go by the data, we might not be in bubble, but they have been wrong before. That is why we had that those uh, real estate crisis. Another thing is utility. So when people think about NFTs, they basically think about uh, an image. No, this is not what technology is about. So it can be used for ticketing like NFT could represent a ticket to a particular event or a, a ticket to a particular club or a ticket or say so like OK, so I'll be very brief about it. What I am doing, I am uh, a digital asset manager and I help people invest in high yielding pools. Uh, these are risky assets by the way. So but what I did, uh, what I am developing is I'm developing an NFT. You are rewarded with an NFT. It will have a share of pool and you would be getting rewards based on your percentage holding of the pool. So your NFT would represent your ownership in the pool. I think it makes sense to you. Uh, I don't know, but Suppose you come to me, you say, OK, I want there is a digital assets worth one crore. I want to invest 20 lakhs. And I'm saying, OK, let us create a pool and I have uh, so I so I create uh, this pooling mechanism on my website and I ask people, OK, if you want to pool in your money through MetaMask, you can do that. And people do that. You basically own 20% of whatever rewards we reap. And I will issue an NFT which would signify that you th under this particular pool you hold 20%. So this is a completely different dimension to the NFT technology that we have talked. They, uh, even real estate, uh, metaverse real estate is uh, implemented through uh, NFT technology. So when people say that these are overvalued, these are undervalued, it depends on per person to person mm -hmm. and it depends how you value them. There are, but Remember, there are fundamental funda underlying fundamentals behind it, and I won't be going into it because uh, I have limited time, but do not think that it is all speculative. Do your research and like you can arrive at a fair value. Uh, I want uh, to discuss. Yes, 
Uh, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you, sir. Uh, there's uh, some sort of echo. echo. I'm sorry okay, if you... Uh, okay, okay. Let me... Uh, let yeah. me... Let's, let's Is it better now? Hello? Uh, yes, sir. So I just wanted to say that uh, due to time constraints, we would request if you would be able to wrap yes. up your presentation. J just give me two more minutes, two to three more minutes, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so this is basically it's decentralized autonomous organization. So basically instead of a company, you can have this particular structure, which only which is only on the Internet, on the blockchain. And basically uh, people purchase your tokens and they get to vote on how the treasury is managed. So this is a whole new ecosystem you can read the text a DAO is a centralized a decentralized autonomous organization it is a type of organization that is managed by people but by people pro programs also known as smart contracts DAOs offer an alternative way to build a company and have gained in this momentum just to give you a context a DAO is purchasing a baseball or uh, some team in Denver so they are spending four billion for that and this is the first time that a DAO is able to gather that kind of support and spend that kind of money on a physical asset. But let us not get into details of it. Uh, uh, how DAO is controlled, basically the token owners get a right to vote. Uh, so they, it is just like a share, uh, the price, uh, like it can be termed as shares. Uh, there is a whole security versus token delay, which tokens are securities, which ones are utility. But uh, basically, this is still a gray area, but uh, we can expect a lot of DAOs coming up in near future. Uh, so these are uh, advantages and disadvantages of DAO uh, with respect to company. DAO is a flat structure company, it's hierarchical CEO. Maybe his people under him or her people under him or her. The DAOs are transparent. Companies are very opaque. DAOs have a loose sort of governance. Companies are very, very rigid. This, this has open members a membership invite only. If I want wanted to invest in say Zomato or Paytm, say five years back, I couldn't do that. But through DAO, this has become a possibility to invest in good projects, good ideas. Types, I do not want to get into it. My company's name is Wealthile. Uh, my product's name is Wealthile. And I basically consider myself as investment DAO that we discussed earlier. Uh, you can launch your own token. Uh, you have to come up with good white paper. You have to select a good blockchain to do, do your code on. Just like Ethereum, there is Solana, BNB, BNB Smart Chain, uh, etc. You and there is a transaction fee associated with it that you pay in the native token. So people are moving away from Ethereum just because of transaction cost. Yes, it is very easy to launch your token, but you have to understand that not everything can be tokenized and you have to come up with sound mechanisms as to why you are doing it uh, before you can launch your own token. That is the end. Thank you, sir, for such a detailed insight into the world of blockchains and digital assets. Uh, taking the lead after Dr. Karthik's amazing presentation is a difficult ask in itself, but your simplistic yet descriptive approach was extremely well presented and simplified the complexities of the digital world. We uh, express our sincere gratitude for giving this insightful presentation. Now, I would like to uh, I would like to give the fair mic to so that she can conduct the Q&A round. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. It was a really insightful session. Now I would like the audience to po post any questions that they have in the chat box. I will read it uh, to sir and then you could answer it.
uh, please put your questions in the chat box. So we'll just wait for two to three minutes more. I guess they are typing the uh, questions. It is cool. <laughs> it is a fairly complex topic yes, and like yes. everyone seemed to have a yes. thorough discussion before as well. So they yeah. might be tired. It is fine. Uh, sir, there is a question in the chat box that I would uh, like to read. Uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are decentralized systems. Uh, uh, just a second. Are decentralized systems of currencies that cannot be controlled by national institutions like banks with political interests. Yet this anonymity also brings a lack of accountability. What is it? Uh, what is to prevent cryptos from being used for illicit activities like funding terrorism or organized crime without institutional barriers. Let me ask you uh, one question like uh, it, it will help you understand this. What is the most widely used currency that is used for terrorist funding for purchase of drugs, etc. It is US dollar. It is uh, INR Indian rupee. Why don't we raise questions on that? Like uh, I understand that uh, and it, it, it is the fact of the matter that these are used. Why are we scrutinizing only uh, these digital currencies? Why? And we know that a lot of business, a lot of money is uh, being used that way. And these uh, organizations or en enforcement agencies that we talk about, they are coming up ways, coming up with ways to track these cryptocurrencies as to how did they generate. So I'll tell you an example of my client. So he was trading in on Binance uh, exchange using P2P. That is why P2P is dangerous. A person to person, you might know about it. So I'm directly transacting with a person without any say proper KYC or verification. And the thing is, uh, he actually transferred some money into a person's bank account to get US dollar tether. The problem is that money was used for terrorist financing. And a person did, never knew it was never his in, intention. So that INR was used, but uh, he was the one who got caught and he was summoned to some uh, court in, uh, sorry, some police station in Mumbai. And there is a whole story behind it. But my main answer to that question is we never consider that our fiat system is flawed itself. Our fiat currencies are used for these illicit activities and we never question them. Why question only Bitcoin? Question everything. Thank you, sir. So there is another question. Uh, it says that uh, as you've said that countries like El Salvador adopted uh, Bitcoin as, as they do not trust fiat. 
they have usd and btc both as legal tender and choose to adopt bitcoin to avoid the transaction fee in remittances and transfers from abroad so do you think they uh, do you think they are alternatives for each other so okay so bitcoin is uh, the stable token so it is the world currency internet currency that we have been talking about since 1980s usdt is just a cryptocurrency representation of us dollar uh, maintained by some um, some company in hong kong so the thing is uh, if you so right now obviously bitcoin is not stable and we have seen fluctuations in dollar inr as well uh, we these are not alternatives to each other these are complementary to each other so without if usdt would not have been there we wouldn't have bitcoin the way it has been adopted it has become the backbone of uh, our digital currency ecosystem and uh, if someone wants stability so especially in these volatile times what uh, people uh, i also did it so i converted all my crypto holdings into us dollar because i know that they cannot go beyond uh, they cannot go down beyond a certain value but if you think that you want volatility you are fine with it then btc is the answer and in future we hope i personally think that it would stabilize Thank you so much, sir. Uh, these are the only questions that were in, uh, that were in the chat box. So thank you so much, sir, for clearing uh, the doubts that we had, and it was a really insightful session. Now I would like to hand it over to Amit, sir, for proposing the vote of thanks. Uh, hello, good morning uh, to everyone. Um, it's it's an honor to pro to propose the vote of thanks. On behalf of the Economic Association of Sri Venkateshwara College, on the second day of the place point, uh, it's it's an absolute uh, privilege to hear from you, uh, Mr. Siddharth. Uh, it it seems you are an ardent supporter of uh, bitcoins. Uh, well, I, I I I beg to differ on that, but still, uh, your views uh, needs to be respected. So uh, I would like also to express my heartfelt thanks uh, to Mr. Siddharth Dalmia uh, for sharing such great knowledge. And information with all of us. The session was really informative, and it was really interesting to know about uh, bitcoins, cryptocurrencies, metaverse, as well as obviously the changing shape of economics. The potential digital economics has its use, and today we got to know about this. We are really grateful uh, to uh, Mr. Siddharth. Thanks, thanks. It's it's a privilege to have you here, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, it was privilege. Uh, it felt great to be invited for this particular forum. And yes, I support uh, digital adoption. And thanks for giving me op an opportunity to present my views and uh, help people understand what where we might be headed. And we uh, and it and I really respect your views. My father shares your sentiment, and we constantly have debates regarding this. But obviously, anyone can be right about this. We do not know where we are headed regarding this. Yeah, the organizers can come in. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. We we shall be concluding the session now. Thank you to everyone present, sir, and thank you once again.